desertification and a changing climate, meaning that Sub-Saharan Africa faces rising food insecurity. And it's now more than ever more important to have data to mitigate these challenges, which is crucial, but for much of the continent, we're seeing a number of data gaps um, still remain. So we're hoping that a number of our panelists will be able to address um, what needs to really be done, what's the current situation from the different perspective, perspectives of their different work. So to start us off, introduce myself. My name is um, Shalin Migwe Kagume, based here in Nairobi, Kenya. I'm a regional lead for Development Gateway in, the, uh, in East Africa. Um, and I'm joined here by, and I'll start off by asking Dr. Hua to introduce himself, and we'll just do a round of introductions for all panelists. Hello, my name is Hua Ni, and I'm with IBM Consulting based in Washington, D.C. I have a background in operation research. I have the role of chief uh, analytics and data scientist. It is my interest of uh, to applying uh, AI and analytics to solve complex operational problems. Thank you, Dr. Mwani. Next, uh, Swetha, if you could just introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Swetha Ramaswamy. I'm the VP of Data Science at Frame, a startup based in Washington, D.C. Uh, Frame is a geospatial data company that combines survey data with satellite imagery. And as head of the data science team, I spend most of my day thinking about how our processes affect our products. Awesome. Thanks for that. Next, we'll have Dr. Wilatawu from SIAT to introduce himself. Hi, uh, my name is Wilatawu Berra. I work for the Alliance of Diversity International in SIAT, which is one of the CJR center. Uh, at the center, I am I'm doing a lot of data analytics and machine learning to, to develop decision support tools uh, related to agronomy solutions and, and irrigation management in general. I'm based here in Addis Ababa. Um, and thank you for inviting me for this interesting topic. Awesome, thanks for that. Uh, Zulfa, over to you. All right, hi everyone. Um, my name is Bobina, Bobina Zulfa, and uh, I'm based in Kampala, Uganda. I work with an organization called Policy. We're a civic technology organization. We work at the intersection of data, tech, and society. Myself, I'm a data and digital rights researcher, so I've been doing a lot of work around the social impact of AI systems across the African continent. Good to meet you all. Thanks, Bobina. Next is uh, Christian, if you could just introduce yourself from Genesis. Sure. Thanks, Charlene. Um, so my name is Kostian. I'm an economist and computer scientist with a company called Genesis Analytics. Genesis is an economic development consultancy with a focus on Africa. Um, our team works to develop policies and strategies that help to leverage um, technology to develop uh, to um, achieve development objectives in Africa. So we'll move over to Charles, who will now introduce himself. Thank you. Um, my name is Charles Mwangi. I'm the Acting Director of Space Sector and Technology Development at the Kenya Space Agency. What that role entails is uh, overseeing the earth observation applications, space science applications, uh, research, education, and outreach uh, at the agency. Thanks for that. So I think we'll just dive right into it. Um, and I'll start it with Dr. Huani, uh, who started us off around thinking through when it comes to climate change and agriculture, where has AI been particularly effective and useful? And um, we're hoping you could bring your perspectives over your 20 years of experience as um, the chief analytics and data scientist um, at IBM Consulting. What are some of the most impactful areas where you've seen climate change, I mean, um, artificial intelligence being very useful in that sector? I think um, just as we know that AI and the machine learning is really excelled into in learning from the past data patterns. Um, it is where we have a vast uh, amount of data that we can learn from the past. For example, satellite data that we have to accumulate, but it has been hard to really get value from it. And then in the recent years, you definitely see the rise of that. For example, recently, IBM announced the work with NASA on analyzing the satellite data to help better tracking um, climate change and, and uh, identify uh, potential mitigation and strategies and things like that. IBM also have worked uh, significantly in the agriculture business applying the AI and machine learning to support areas such as um, the crop yield or moisture detections and the disease con uh, pest control areas. These are the places where we, we can bring the data that we use used to be not be able to utilize very effectively, but bring the AI and, and machine learning to really digest and learn from that and apply the insight to the uh, on the ground operations that you say. Wonderful. Great perspectives around um, 
the crop yield, moisture detection, disease and crop, crop detection. Um, but then for us to get there, of course, there's a lot of investments that need that. There's still some gaps that we see. What gaps do you do? Do we need to really address to get the full potential of AI um, in terms of addressing key, key climate change areas? You've mentioned interesting initiatives with NASA that you're doing on climate change, and now we're able to really get key data patterns that we were not able to tell that story before. But what are the additional, like what needs to be done to really get that full potential that we're looking for? There is always this iterative nature as we learn more and more data, right? A learn, apply, and learn. That's that's where we need to get started. We don't have to start as a big bang, but really need to get connected from the high level where where AI can be applied to local areas. In my mind, I do think that the local initiative that's sponsored by donors by um, international development uh, community has been is going to be the key as we expand the apply of AI and, and machine learning. Great. Uh, when just to ask you to respond a bit more, when you mean by local areas, do we mean um, maybe maybe more country context specific initiatives, or what do we mean by local areas? I mean even going within the country initiatives, uh, so in a particular regions, and really that, that demonstrate the the value of AI, and then that brings in the positive loop. participations. Sorry, Wani, we lost you for a second. Maybe you could just repeat your last point on the local areas. I just uh, encourage the local participations through uh, the use of the AI and then generate the value and that's generated the positive reinforcement feedback. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I think it's a good point to, to add in Spitha from uh, Fram. Um, and and um, Dr. Huan Yu has mentioned interesting perspectives of the intersection between uh, remote sensing and AI. So we've seen in the sector, it's really, um, they really complement each other well. Um, but we've seen a number of initiatives that are addressing those data gaps around remote sensing, uh, using artificial intelligence, as Dr. Huan Yu has mentioned, to really identify the patterns. Um, and then he's also mentioned issues about local areas so thinking about contextualizing some of these initiatives but we've seen some of these initiatives very fragmented fragmented in the sector so there's a lot of initiatives and investment going to different initiatives all trying to address the same thing but there's a, a limited collaboration do you agree with first of all with this and um how can we best better foster uh, collaboration across all these actors that have these different initiatives yes i agree i mean i think one of the things that has been difficult as a startup in this space is that different people are ready for different levels of technology and different levels of data right um it's an interesting problem because um as noted you know we have unprecedented access to data but that data is so needed for areas that experience climate risk the most um, but the consequence of not having access to that data over decades has meant that a lot, a lot of processes have been set up to circumvent that. And a lot of people have put in time and effort thinking about, well, how do we gain that contextual knowledge? Because we don't, we simply don't have the data. Um, and so I think uh, one thing that we've definitely learned is that it's not enough to, um, it's not enough to simply have data and provide data and it's not enough to have and provide data just through major contract vehicles it's also important to think through how the end users will access the data um, whether they can do so regularly and um, who the end receivers of that data are because the people who are using it may not be the same people who are benefiting it from it the most and so there is like a whole host of uh, of questions that um, come about uh, when considering like how can we be most effective in making sure that everyone's priorities are aligned. Um, yeah. Really great perspectives around the having the user in mind in all our data initiatives um, and also gaining the contextual knowledge the importance of data in understanding the contextual knowledge. And I'll just push it back to Dr. Huani, just to bring that back up to, you had mentioned some, some of the initiatives such as crop yield, um, moisture detection, disease, crop, crop, protect, crop detection, and also the initiatives that you have with, um, with NASA on climate change. Maybe to dig deeper around 
how have we been able to uh, uh, prioritize the users in some of these initiatives? Um, and I've, I've been pointed you because IBM has really fantastic, um, being, being a big tech company, really fantastic initiatives around um, AI. So how are you able as an institution to really focus on the user in the, as the end goal? This is where I think, I believe this is where the opportunity, but also the challenges is, lies. We just as, um, the previous uh, panelists mentioned about the access of the data, how uh, like the satellite data are there. We have some information to be able to, let's just say that monitor this um, soy moisture level, right? But the thing is we do need more contextual data to improve the accuracy and the effectiveness of it. And also, even if you just publish this data, how effectively it's being utilized is going not going to be fully re realized. So it is that local partnership is needed to start. I believe that in the past we worked, I believe there was, um, IBM worked with South Africa in, for, in some of the farmer uh, related effort to utilize it, but we, ne we need to see more scale that to be applied to it. So I think that it is bringing the user in you know, through IBM, we talk about design thinking about how garage to really put user centric needs um, uh, in the uh, concentration in everything that we do. So that is beneficial, but we still need the community to bring together. I think IBM as a tech company needs the international development community as a partner to be really truly realize the benefits of the technology in wherever, where, wherever it is needed the most. Great, and I think that answers some of the questions we had in terms of collaborative efforts. Um, over to you, Spatha, and I think um, Dr. Hwani has mentioned that we um, there needs to be collaboration through um, design thinking, local partnerships, contextualizing data, um, and these partnerships are needed. So Spatha, I was hoping you could give us maybe an example, thinking of it from a startup perspective and a question that works really with the end users in mind. Um, any, any examples you can think of some partnerships that have worked around this? Have you as um, from um, really worked with the private sector? What are some of the challenges around that? I mean, this is our entire model, right? Is working with clients who regularly have as much or more contextual knowledge of the um, end users than we do. And that's how we see our, like that's when our partnerships are most effective are when we bring in some technical expertise and some data expertise and some machine learning expertise, but when we're generating our models, we do so with, with counterparts who are either in country in the areas that we're working in or we're in, um, yeah, so, so the, uh, sorry, uh, so that, or, or who are, you know, working with us in DC, but who regularly travel to the field, right? Because that's not, that's not where we as a startup do best um, because we rely on a lot of um, heavy tech and most of our tech is built in DC. So uh, some successful partnerships um, have been working with the Gates Foundation to identify, uh, right now we have a, a partnership to identify and work with um, nutrition. Um, so identifying areas where uh, we could improve childhood nutrition outcomes. Um, and similarly, um, areas, we, we also have a partnership with them on child marriage. And that has worked out really well for us because while we could hire the expertise that we need for, um, for these areas, they're so different, right? And so our goal here isn't to try and apply a single model to multiple areas and call it a day. Our goal is to work with the decades of experience that people have generated um, without access to um, the same data that we provide and see how we can enhance that and how we can track that over time and how we can add in perhaps a new lens that wasn't there before. Um, and I find that these are the types of partnerships that are the most effective because there are people who already know what they don't know right? There are known unknowns. And that is when I think a lot of magic happens. Thanks. Thanks for that. Svetha. Yeah. Great points in terms of partnerships to really make sure data is used and it's um, really impactful uh, for the local context. So I hand it over to Dr. Wuletau um, from SIAT. 
And we know SIAT has been in the forefront of leveraging on technology such as AI to inform, to inform agriculture policy globally. So working with the diverse data sets you work with, and Dr. Wuletawi, you also mentioned that you are also, your work focuses on also agronomy and in, input optimization, which does need a lot of data sets and aggregating a lot of um, data sets to really, and also having the end users in mind as we learned from the two former panelists. How can AI really improve the efficiency of turning this many regional data sets into maybe actionable um, insights? Yes, thank you very much. So in, in general, in CGIR, you know, the, the global, uh, research network um, we we conduct around three topics. The first one is about developing a fair data sets, a fair like findable, accessible, interpolable, and uh, uh, and reusable data sets. So basically, we need to have a lot of data sets, particularly agronomic data sets, that will that will help us to you know to to guide decision at. A different level at farmer level at decision support level and at the government level so this means it's all about combining large data sets in different region in africa or beyond in latin america and asia uh, so for that cgr has a unique position because we have long-term uh, agronomy trial data collection in different region globally and and also we are working with the local partners, with the governments, with the research organization in each government. So we can leverage that partnership to, to pull large data sets so, so that we can use those, those, those data to feed to the machine learning and, and the analysis. So, so in general, uh, there is a lot of efforts in transforming the data ecosystems because my colleagues, uh, the previous speakers, they, they talk a lot about the, the remote sensing data sets, but the bigger gap is more the local level agronomic management data sets. So like the fertilizer uh, amount, uh, the, the fertilizer application that the farmer is applying in a particular locations with a particular soil attributes, the climate conditions. So this kind of data set is really scarce across the globe and very difficult to, to use machine learning and artificial intelligence to, to optimize uh, inputs or fertilizer or irrigation schedules or you know all these kind of uh, on-ground uh, actionable activities. So that's what we at CGR are trying to pull data across regions and establish these large data sets. And once we have that with, with capacity building with the government systems and also science across the CG and also alliance in, in the diverse international and CIAD, uh, the idea is also to develop actionable or state-of-the-art machine learning algorithm to analyze that data and to convert it as a decision support tools. So basically, for example, in the in the, in the case that I mentioned, once we build the environment from large remote sensing data, high resolution remote sensing data, and, we'll, and we combine that with a lot of management data sets, irrigation, uh, pesticide, or fertilizer, lime application, all these, then it will be possible to, to do optimization of like artificial intelligence machine learning to establish the relation between particular management practice with the crop yield response. So then it will be possible to optimize that ones. So in that, our approach is not just to do that exercise for a particular location, because a lot of in, uh, companies and business owners or uh, new uh, like te tech companies are doing this kind of analysis. But us as a network of uh, uh, scientists across the global south, our interest is also to standardize that practice across different areas and to, to establish standardized analytical mechanisms. So to go from the data to, to the analytics and also to develop uh, advisory systems that can be actionable on the ground. So that, that can be validated by the farmers, by demand partner on the ground. So uh, maybe I will mention a specific examples that we have this a CG center, a CG wide initiative called Excellence in Agronomy. So particularly the idea is to, to scale or to deliver innovations at scale in the global south using uh, advanced analytics uh, uh, in Africa and beyond, Asia and also Latin America. So, so in that approach, our innovation is from data 
analytics and also dissemination. So the idea is once we generate that standardized outputs or solutions, for example, site-space fertilizer, or irrigation scheduling, or uh, the climate information, the planting data, or kind of this, uh, we wanted to work with the farmers to validate if we have a challenge around that, if that can be really actionable on the ground and get the feedback from the farmer if that is actual fat is useful in many ways. So we have kind of a use case or demand partner across the, uh, the global south, then they, they use our innovation solutions to test it and to, to validate it, and they give us a feedback to, to improve that mechanisms. And then the whole idea is the, 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 the system has to be you know, from end to end. We start from the data, deliver solution on the ground on, uh, at a plot level uh, in the farmer field, and then we get the feedback mechanism to improve the analytics and the machine learning in that sense. So that's why in many ways, the machine learning is really helpful to deploy innovations and also to, to revise and to learn quickly and then improve, improve the systems. So that's really what we do in CGR under excellence in agronomy. So, so one of the global initiative that we try to support large number of demand partner in, in, in Africa, Asia and Latin America. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was very comprehensive. Thank you for that. So I think it goes, I think the conversation is moving on well in terms of the different institutions that have different roles at the different levels. So we've seen private sector that are able to come in and provide some of these technologies. We've seen startups uh, such as Fram who are also coming up with these technologies. And then now we have SEAT that are actually proving some of these models on the ground with farmers um, in terms of um, agronomy and what is really useful to the farmer. So I think the last question I have for you, Dr. Vletao, is um, working with different countries, as we know, country governments, capacities really vary. Um, uh, and for regional institutions such as yourself that have to work with the different uh, governments with different um, capacities, different needs, different farmer needs, different agricultural and agro or agronomical needs. What are some of the, we have a lot of regional bodies that are at the point of starting that journey that CIAT and CJR are, are at, such as the Africa Union. What advice would you give them in terms of how to really engage uh, country level institutions with different um, capacities and how to scale some of the models that they already have? Yeah, thank you very much. So, you know, in, in the other data ecosystem area, like remote sensing and others, because the owner are limited a few companies and, you know, large companies, the global companies that provide this data, service providers, it's much easier to, to manage the data management system. And, and, but in the case of, you know, agronomic data, the data on the ground on the farmer practices, it's very challenging because First thing, they are not available there, and the data collection is not standardized across different countries. It's very challenging. The second one is the, the capacity building. I mean, the, the thinking that the local governments they uh, have in relation to data access to to you know to regional objectives, national objectives, and national initiatives is still low at this stage. So we need to work with with the government with the local. Uh, institutions on how existing innovations in terms of the data collection mechanism, the data sharing can, can help to, to transform some of these challenges and uh, suspicions around data sharing and data, uh, you know, pulling data together for a, a greater objective. So I think that's the key, but also we need to note that this data ecosystem uh, uh, thing need a longer time to, to change because it's, 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 a, it's a, a behavioral change thing. It's not like, it's not just you, you, you get access to the data overnight and you change everything or you, you, you tell the objective and then institutions and leaders will, will convert into, into this idea. So, so it takes some years to change the behavior of the, the government's institutions so that bringing all this agronomy data, data that can be collected from the farmer practice can, can help improve the, the change in, in yield gain and nutritional gain uh, in agriculture in general. So, so I think that's what I comment on this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Olatau. And I think we'll come back to that in terms of government partnerships. I'll now hand it over to Bobina. Um, and an important area that we 
that I think has come alive on the continent in Africa is um, responsible uh, uh, AI ad adoption. So we've seen the, um, the value AI can bring in terms of data analytics, in terms of different innovations in the continent. So it can be a life-changing technology, but we need to understand that there, there, there are some privacy and ethical uh, data use concerns that come with that. So uh, we know that policy does a lot of research around um, ethical data use, um, uh, thinking about it from a policy perspective and also a data use perspective. So I wanted to know your perspective of where we are as, as a continent on privacy and ethical data um, and AI adoption. Okay. Um, all right. Um, thanks for the question, Charlene. Um, I, I, I just like wanted to just start from a place of just maybe broadly sort of painting the picture because I think um, as we talk about, you know, ethical AI adoption or development across the continent, it's, it's um, important to, to understand the context of, you know, what's happening on the continent because it's not uh, exactly what's happening elsewhere in the world. So um, for starters, you know, what we see, you know, in, in terms of, you know, AI development or um, adoption deployment, um, we see a lot of adoption is really happening within the public sector. Um, so this is mostly within government systems, and uh, this is, you know, especially related to, um, you know, security and identification, and now we're also moving more towards services, but we also see um, development, uh, and, you know, we see a startup ecosystem, and, you know, um, that's, you know, budgeting, growing, where, um, you know, uh, a lot of it is really domain specific. So, you know, like uh, a lot of the conversation today has been around agriculture, but we also see, you know, ed techs and health techs and, you know, domain sp uh, specific AI systems that are being developed. Um, and, 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 and of course, also just um, the consumer AI, which much, 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 much of which is coming from the West. And, you know, this is mostly, of course, being um, consumed by the knowledge worker base or the upper middle class and et cetera. So, you know, just, you know, um, understanding that that is sort of the realm, uh, you know, to sort of look at where, where is the data in Africa and where is the adoption and development happening, we can sort of then try to, you know, unpack issues of ethical development and privacy and et cetera. So you, um, I'll, I'll just start from, you know, I think that um, speaks very directly to um, issues of data governance across Africa. Um, I, I would just say I think Africa is at a point right now where you know it's strengthening a lot of its um, you know data protection and you know legal regulations and etc. Um, for example, looking at what was happening from like maybe the past year 2022, it's you know a lot of governments are you know. Um, now, you know, uh, taking on a lot of the data protection um, laws and, you know, um, making them official and updating them and um, so on and so on. Of course, just looking at from like the top down at the AU level, uh, the Malabo Convention, we still see that few countries are still signatory to it and even much less uh, those that have ratified it. But we see that efforts are still, you know, um, I guess more countries are now more driven towards the conversation as it becomes, I guess, uh, more widespread. So um, just, you know, from just uh, understanding that that's sort of, you know, the way uh, data is being perceived from a governance um, approach, uh, I, I think it's then we can just, you know, sort of look at, you know, what are the issues then that, you know, arise from this, this data governance ecosystem. I think for starters, it would be, you know, the very data governance, there is a lot of um, wide gaps in, you know, the instruments that we have in place for data governance. Um, in, in as much as also, you know, the, the substances of, of, of these data governance frameworks and regulations that are being taken on across the continent, across the continent, excuse me. So for example, um, you know, we'll see that a lot of countries, um, very few countries on the continent barely have a national AI strategy. So I do not, it does, it barely makes sense, you know, to say that we're able to regulate these systems if we don't even have in place a national AI, um, you know, regulatory system for a lot of the countries. Um, we also see gaps when it comes to, you know, um, governments and, and um, I think also just a lot of the other, um, you know, key actors in the ecosystem being able to access the data with exactly what they are doing. So I, I think, for example, when you look at the data, I mean, the, 
the the public sector, which has you know, which is adopting a lot of these you know, say facial recognition technologies and etc. We don't know what is being done with uh, citizens' data. What how is it being um, how is it being stored? How is it being protected? Because we don't have access to this this information that the government has and. Um, for example, a civil society uh, who are doing research around this area, you can barely find this information anywhere. So I, fi I find that a lot of what we have is sort of what's happening within the consumer AI ecosystem, and even a lot of that is not very much grounded in Africa. So we do have large data gaps in just trying to understand uh, issues of you know ethical and um, ethical AI adoption and development across the continent. I think also just the other thing would really come down to, um, you know, issues of consent. So we see a lot of, you know, boilerplate contracts um, with, you know, the technologies that are that are being adopted or, you know, developed across the continent. So in terms of adoption, for example, again, uh, I will point very much to the public sector governments because I think a lot of, um, you know, adoption is happening within that space. Um, I don't think, uh, you know, citizens have a lot of, um, you know, leeway to meaningfully consent to a lot of these systems so for example with the national identification systems or you know the the security systems that we have to be subjected to and all this uh, it, it, it's sort of like it, it's it's clamping down on on you know the privacy of citizens because if if you, you you don't consent to these then a lot of times you for example with identification system you don't have access to core services and etc so that is just really um again to point around issues of you know ethical and and uh just issues around that space of course there is uh also issues around the extractivist um digital infrastructure in place but this comes especially from the consumer ai that's coming down on the continent we're dependent on a lot of technologies from the west which is okay but um if you know these systems entrench inequalities uh because of you know the, the the system that we put in place which is you know extractive and the people on the other end the data there is owners and now people who are just subjects and do not really have any control over what their data is so issues of data injustice arise so these are just i, I would say some of the issues i'll just very quickly map out and then just to i guess wrap this up um i don't know if you are going to ask me this but i don't know if you'd want me to very quickly get over to the point of maybe what could be done or should it just yeah okay um uh, so i i would say first and foremost it's it's very important and i think um um abera mentioned you know uh hinted on this i think it's very important uh that our governments are facilitated in building their capacities around regulating these systems because a lot of the people who are you know in say the data protection offices or national IT or just at different um, levels of government do not really understand you know what are these AI systems what 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 is what is their benefit how how could they be used to impact the lives of you know um, citizens for the better so I think there is need to to build capacities of of policy makers around AI legislation, I think there is also a need to um, to to do, like I, I mentioned earlier, there is need for more research on the continent around all these issues of you know ethical adoption around just understanding you know how is data being how is it being used how is it being controlled how is it being stored. I think there is a lot of data data gaps across the continent, so there is need for more research around that. And I guess I'll just um, also really a multidisciplinary approach. So for example, I'd say I'm on this um, panel, but I wouldn't say we do exactly the same way because. Uh, I think most of the pe pe people on this panel are data scientists. On the other hand, I'm a social researcher. So I think, you know, just having all these different viewpoints and, you know, finding how to merge, merge them would, you know, ultimately just lead to a more, you know, ethical um, uh, da uh, AI data ecosystem. So I'll just say like to sum it up as a whole, I think what we really like to say is, you know, ethics should not be an afterthought. Ethics shouldn't be an add-on. It's something that should be considered from the get-go, as you know, as from the end. For example, as as developers, as developers, or even as the governments, the people adopting these systems. Um, yeah, I will st stop right there for now. Thank you. Thank you, Bobina. That was really insightful. I think yeah. So we've seen. I, th I think it's a discussion that 
has been an afterthought in the past. And thanks for institutions such as policy and a number of research institutions that are really pushing for, I like the idea that you brought about building the capacity of government. Um, and based in Nairobi, I've seen a lot of initiatives around supporting the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner here in Kenya to really push for um, implementation of the Data Protection Act um, here in Kenya. So agreed, a lot of capacity that's needed in terms of reg uh, regulation, regulating for government. Um, some uh, interesting thoughts about the national AI strategy. It's interesting that if we think about agriculture, uh, more pharma-centric approaches are really important for um, the agriculture space. Um, and Wuleta we brought up a really good point of um, having the farmers in mind as in some of the solutions and testing out some of these models to really make sure that they're really useful for the farmers. So just a quick one at Development Gateway, we did a, a research um, um, around pharmacentric models that I will also share at the end of this series and thinking through what really does, as we collect all this data um, and think about all these models, what does it really mean for farmers? So um, I will hand it over to our next speaker, which is Christian on um, from Genesis. And, and I was hoping you could bring a bit of a, a private sector approach and thinking through because of some of the work that you've done in the past, what really is the role of private sector in ensuring responsible use and um, access and use of AI technologies by citizens um, and, and governments? And Bobina mentioned that it should not be an afterthought. Do we think the private sector is also now embracing um, uh, data governance in some of the work that they're doing? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks very much, Charlene. Um, and thanks for the question. It, it, it's a really great one. Um, so. I think that there are five, maybe six areas that come to mind in terms of the role of the private sector, and these are uh, vary in the way that they touch on the agricultural sector. I'll try to bring it back to that. Um, but the first is the um, set of institutions or companies that are really pushing the frontier of AI technologies forward. Um, so it's all over the news, but this is your, your open AI, this is your Microsoft, this is your Google, and it's all the excitement around the sort of generative AI technologies, which holds great promise for the agricultural sector. Um, potentially the delivery of personalized um, advisory and extension services, if you can get a, a human intermediary um, to, for example, help more skill producers understand when to feed or what the impact of an anticipated input might be. Um, but these institutions are doing very important work in discovering um, potential new ways that AI technologies can be used in the agricultural sector. And their responsibility then is to continue to push that frontier forward, but doing so in a way that we think is safe for society. So ensuring that we understand whether or not it is robust, we understand its limitations, that these are communicated, um, and that ultimately the, the, the technologies that they build are aligned with social objectives in some way or another. Um, I do think that there's also another function that they need to perform, which is um, how we adapt these sort of general um, frontier AI technologies to specific domains. Um, so can we, for example, refine um, a large language model um, to operate the foundation model in the agricultural sector that then can be adopted across different markets and by a variety of service providers. Um, so that would be desirable. That would be really great. Um, also, if they could, you know, open source these learnings and also the byproducts of, of their research. So that's the first bit. Um, the second bit, I think, touches on a, a couple of areas that my, my fellow panelists have, have talked about, which is um, the set of ag techs to make it ag specific, but the institutions that actually make use of AI technologies and are, let's call it consumer facing or farmer facing. Um, so, for example, this might be narrow AI technologies like a plant techs, um, or it might be frontier or forthcoming um, uh, ag tech providers that make use of these large language models. So their responsibility really is how do we take these um, various AI solutions and adapt them to the specific needs um, of their um, user base? And how do we ensure that the outputs that these technologies produce are in fact safe? Um, because the worst case scenario is producing some sort of detrimental output that lands on some sort of negative outcome for a, a small scale producer. Um, some bad advice that leads them to lose a crop or something along those lines. Um, so really that's at the sort of the core, the interface there. Um, I think the third element is, is this question about data collection and data reuse, which we've also touched on in a couple of different ways. Um, so a lot of these ag techs we know are um, collect data through the services that they provide. Maybe it's data on um, the inputs that farmers are, are um, purchasing. Maybe it's data on their location. Maybe it's data on their yields. And because this data is accumulated, um, it becomes a very valuable commercial asset. 
And so subsequently, there is no, there's the disincentive to share it. Um, and so, you know, I think that there's an important um, space for thinking about how do we break these um, incentives or create some sort of mechanisms for data reuse, getting that data out of these commercial entities and supporting their reuse across other areas. Um, so it's not just the ag techs themselves, but also just if we want to stretch a little bit, you know, for example, your mobile network operators might have great stores of, of um, speech data, which could then be used for um, text to speech and, and the like. So, Things useful here might be some sort of agricultural data exchange or the like, but but there's got to be there, there surely should be some sort of mechanism to support sharing, as um, Ule Tao had, had mentioned. Um, I think the the fourth is is something to do with funding. Um, so you know there's 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 the need of capital for various startups who are, have these great ideas, these innovative ideas that want to use um, AI technologies. Um, effectively and as we've mentioned there aren't in any sort of pre-existing governance mechanisms so is there a, an opportunity for um, funders of startups to start to think about um, whether or not there are any sort of predetermined AI ethical principles um, or some sort of minimum standards of accuracy that need to be that need to be deployed in order to source the funding maybe it's more so for the the development finance like the dfi sort of um, community, but maybe there's some sort of framing of that within the private sector as well. Um, and then the last element um, looks at companies such as, you know, myself or um, various other intermediaries, which is how do we translate and also uh, just speaking to back to our policy panelists, how do we help to translate an understanding of what these technologies are, what they can do um, in a way that policymakers and regulators can understand them and can respond to them more effectively. Um, so I think that that is actually a responsibility across all of these private sector actors, which is that there aren't any sort of, I suppose, mechanisms of governance at the moment or any firm mechanisms of governance. It's all sort of like self-governance mechanisms. And as we come to, uh, I suppose, in, uh, as we come to understand the need for AI and data regulation more generally um, and understanding of how that might apply or be adapted to the agricultural sector specifically, I think that there's a co-creation process that can that, that would be incredibly useful between the private sector and, and the public sector and associated regulators. Thank you so much, Christian. I think it's great points on the private sector. I think sometimes as development partners, we we put a lot of onus on government. Um, and sometimes private sector really has a key role in terms of responsible data use. So just responsible use of technology particularly at uh, AI, and you brought up really good points about, I love the point of pushing the frontier, um, because private sector invest a lot in some of these interesting models. Um, how can we, how can those models be adopted by um, different partners and just for, uh, data, uh, digital for good, for example, um, and then thinking around some of the funding. Um, and the one that I really want to follow up on, on is a mechanism for governance, and it's an interesting one um, around co-creation with private and development partners. Is there, is there some um, some advice you'd give on how to, to jumpstart that process? Has it started? Are there initiatives that already exist? Or how could we, because we have private sector here, we have development partners here. We'll be talking to someone from government uh, later also. How can we really jumpstart that process? I, I think it all starts at the, the forums of committed people that are mutually interested and, and, and want to, to, to push that that sort of narrative forward. I imagine that there must be something that is, is existing and emerging, but I, I suppose it needs some degree of impetus and some sort of champion. Maybe maybe that's kind of what, what would be um, really useful is, is devising some sort of, I don't know, institution, some sort of forum, some sort of network um, that brings all of these parties together um, and locks them into these conversations so that we can make some tangible progress forward. Um, Bit of an intangible answer, but uh, yeah, that's that's what comes to mind. Well, it's a start. That's a start. That's a good yeah. point. Uh, you always need a, a champion to really push for some of these um, issues. And I think I'll also hand it over to Bobina, um, and to think through what Christian has mentioned about private sector role in some of the research work that you've done or the engagements that you've had at the country level. Um, have you really seen this come out in private sector? From your perspective, have you seen it as a, if it's not, is it a perspective of capacity or lack of seeing the value? What do you think would also jumpstart that process? The process of getting um, private sector to be involved in the different things that Christian 
Okay. Sorry, just to clarify, Bimina, and also in some of the issues that you mentioned about ethical um, um, AI strategies, like how do we really bring private sector into the discussion table around ethical adoption of AI? Um, and also having uh, citizens' rights in the adoption of AI. Thanks. Um, I think th th that's one thing that, at least in uh, some of the research we've been doing, uh, we've always put out strongly as a recommendation because we've really called for like a multi-stakeholder approach. And so we've definitely um, always, um, you know, uh, called for private um uh, the private sector's involvement in this because they have the capacity to, they they have the knowledge to, they, they they have a lot of resources in terms of being able to, like you know, Christian said, champion this, not just champion this, but they're 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 a, a very able you know um, partner that could come on and really like um, uh, be a catalyst of sorts to the to the to all these to all these um, all these efforts. And so I I, I think. Um, I, I don't know to what extent it's happening. I've seen, for example, in like the some of like the digital rights conferences I've you know seen around across the continent, there is always an involvement of you know private sector. And um, but I think it's I, I I again I think for me it's what I was saying earlier. Like sometimes you can't really even pin down you know statistically like oh I do know this is happening to this scale. So I don't know to what extent it's happening. I know like there is um, development partners that come in and you know fund some of the research that is happening across the continent around these issues of ethical AI ad ad adoption development or you know funding government work. Um, but I'm, I'm not very you know certain about the level of private sector's involvement. But I do know there are definitely you know an, an actor that would boost these efforts very very much. I think there's an interesting perspectives around the role of private sector. And I'll just, uh, since we have a bit of more time, I'll, I'll go to back to Dr. Huani, who we started off with, around as another private sector in the room. Um, how is um, IBM Consulting Institution really thinking through a, um, um, ethical adoption of AI or some of these technologies? Uh, as, we, as Bobina um, and, and Christian mentioned, from the very beginning of implementation, how are you, how is the institution going, or how would you even advise other private sector institutions to think through this? I think that um, with all the advances of AI and more and more people are realizing that the potential harm that can also be brought if, we, if, it, is, if it is not used responsibly. And um, from a technical perspective, it is important that when we build a model that we consider the potential things that was going to throw off the balance for the AI models, such as the training data and things like the method and how do you test it out and how do you verify the, the, the you know, sort of the unbiasedness or uh, things, potential things like that. But in the meantime, there should also be a governance model in terms of how the decisions or what decisions should be applied or can be applied and how much we can apply, what kind of sort of a potential negative effect that it can bring from the statistical errors. That's as we know that, you know, AI is consisted of statistics and the statistical error is inevitable. There is no guarantee that even if the model is not biased, you are still going to encounter that statistical errors. So how, what is the sort of the negative impact of it? So IBM is very conscious about it, very sensitive about this. And we have our AI governance board that established from a internal governance, but also help uh, the client to establish their AI governance effort to bring, bring that way of thinking and the uh, various way to, to look at it. I do think that it is important that <clears throat> we increase <clears throat> excuse me, uh, we increase the AI literacy uh, throughout as much as we can, because with all the hypes of news, people will, will may be thinking, okay, as long as bring AI, it'll be wonderful, but we know more and we need everybody to be aware of, of these potential uh, pitfalls. And so AI and data literacy should be a foundational effort as we thinking about responsible use of AI. Great points, Dr. Wani. Yeah, so I think it's, it's encouraging to see private sector taking up and understanding their role in the, in the statistical errors in terms of AI and what does that really mean? And also thinking about AI illiteracy, it's very encouraging to see that. So I'll hand it over to Swetha. Uh, as from a startup perspective, um, as we wrap up, 
Um, Christian had also mentioned funding mechanisms for startups. Um, what are some of your thoughts in terms of how to really engage startups in this AI adoption discussion? and also the ethical side of it all. It's, um, it's funny because as he was saying it, I was thinking, oh yeah, like I, that's a, like, that's a great idea because um, the thing that is tricky about being in a startup and being a startup is you're just beholden to so many stakeholderships, right? And often the source of funding is so divorced from the work that you do as a company. And so we're just constantly trying to balance expectations between these different stakeholders. And um, I really love the idea of, of more championing or maybe even a single champion um, and setting those standards because I think it makes it easier then for startups who are really the takers of these best practices um, to implement them across projects, right? Um, like I, I, for example, we work with a lot of survey data. We work with a lot of microdata and, um, fortunately, uh, microdata has been around for quite some time. And so there are PII standards that are implemented as we go through how to use that. Now, could they be updated for a modern era that, um, includes a lot of cloud-based architecture? Absolutely. And they should be, um, but startups are likely not necessarily the people who have the biggest clout in making that happen. And so I think it's really a, a combination approach that um, have been touched on by everyone in this panel. But um, the other thing I will say is I think there's a difference between funders and perhaps like bigger international players who act as funding institutions um, but are but are almost as involved with the creation of of the material um and one of the biggest ways in which we have upgraded our data governance and access to data um to help avoid as bobita pointed out this problem of of data justice and people then not having access to the data is by working with players who can bridge that gap for us who can help um, make it so that we can survive as a company um, but still make the data as accessible as possible. Um, and so I think that it is both having these standards that, um, you know, proper like VC funding and VC funders see as necessary as part of our, our work and processes, and also the people who fund these larger projects who touch on multiple countries, multiple areas, multiple fields of interest, um, who can step in and fill gaps for companies that are perhaps too small to do that themselves. Yeah, great point. I think we've seen the same also in our work at DG, thinking through really making, as what you've said about working with institutions on the ground who can really push for the use of that data um, is an important one. Um, and also thinking through the funding mechanisms around all our work and who are some of the champions. So I like how all this is coming together in, into um, a theme that we're seeing around the different roles of the stakeholders and the collaboration across the different roles. Um, and who's doing what in the in the, in, in the sector. Um, and then I will wrap it up with Dr. Wuleta. Um, we've heard from private sector, we've heard from researchers around uh, ethical data use. Um, and maybe from SEAT's perspective as a development partner, it'll be interesting to see, um, because your work touches on also working with farmers. So you must, I'm assuming you handle a bit of farmer data um, and also working with maybe some sensitive data. Um, you, you said you meant you work a lot with machine learning with the farmer in mind. How else do you, as a, as a research, I mean, as a development partner in, in this discussion, really try to make sure that um, ethical AI adoption is, 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 is one of the key points you consider as you roll out programs? Thank you very much. So maybe in, in a kind of a continuation to what has been said, um, AI in agriculture is still at the early stage in comparison to health, education, or other topics. AI in agriculture is still at the early stage. We are just starting few innovations in general, especially that can be applicable on the ground. So when, it, when we think about ethical issues, it will we, it's just a theoretical at this stage because we are not, um, uh, there is not a lot of farmers that are 
applying this kind of innovations based on the advice from machine learning AI. So it will it will uncover when we start to implement on the ground and most of the, the ethical issue will come out in the future. So we need to be prepared in terms of, you know, work, working with the farmer, what are the concerns, what are the issues. So far, it's more the, the, the theoretical and the ethical issues that are is coming from another domain. So it's very important we need to, to be prepared. And one interesting uh, perspective that I can see is that, for example, in the CG, in SEAT, in the Alliance, and also CGR in general, we are domain-specific experts, a lot of agronomy experts, soil experts, agriculture experts, and then there is uh, people uh, investing a lot on developing this AI, AI technologies like the private company and then and IT companies. So if we bring these two, uh, two entities together on, on addressing the IT, the first to, to, to facilitate the innovations in AI in general, because so far we don't have really a lot of uh, applicable on the ground, especially in the, in the African context, we don't have a lot of innovation. So we need to bring those to facilitate the implementation. So we need to bring the, the domain specific scientists with, with, a, with a, the private IT companies so that we will deploy more more innovation on the ground. And the second one is also, we will be able to identify the, the ethical issues at the early stages as, we, as it was indicated, you know, instead of just learning after we apply a lot of, you know, challenges on the ground, which could affect the, the adoption uh, rate in the future, then it will help us to, to learn, to spot the ethical challenges as we, as we learn and co-develop this innovation together. So I think I, I would see the, the private company, the, the, the researcher, and also the government you know, doing a lot of capacity building in the government and the national institutions will help us to, to address these ones and also to, to, be more, to be more transparent and open in, in the way how we conduct business in AI, in, Af in agriculture in general. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charles. And now I think we'll just move over, over to you to think, to give us more of the government perspective, because you've had from private sector, we've had from development partners on how they're using AI, particularly um, as and responsibly in agriculture and climate change. So we're hoping to get government perspective from you because the Kenya Space Agency has invested in better understanding the uh, intersection of artificial intelligence and earth observations and of providing evidence for policy. So what are some of the best practices you can showcase for how government can harness the power of AI and earth observations? Um, particularly to the space of climate change and agriculture. Thank you for the question. Um, th there is a lot of potential um, in, in both spaces, both um, the AI and the observation and the new fields that are quite evolving. And, and we're seeing a lot of interest also from the private sector and, and they have been the ones who've been urging us to move the conversation in terms of what, what we could do more with AI. Uh, but in terms of other observation, it has been there. Uh, but one of the issues that we've been grappling with is how do we leverage or maximize on the utilization of um, other observation uh, data for decision making. Uh, and we have a, a particular keen interest on agriculture. And the reason why that is important is because our economy is, is majorly supported um, uh, by a huge proportion by agricultural practices. And we've been trying to uh, to ask ourselves how how do we then ensure that the farmer who's on the ground is able to get the information that they're able to use the decisions or to make decisions uh, on their farm practices, and also a policymaker to be able to make uh, decisions uh, that are guided also on data because we are very keen on on how we can leverage on data availability. And one of the things that has uh, that still um, uh, does present issues or problems within the earth observation space is the issues about gaps in terms of data. Uh, so you're looking at data because most of the times you have data that is taken by satellites and satellites do not take data all the time. It depends on when they're over, uh, over a particular region, meaning that you there are points and pieces where you would not have um, certain data sets, uh, either because if you're taking optical data, uh, then there was, maybe there was clouds 
meaning that uh, the, the, the sensor is not able to take that image. And, and what you're seeing in terms of AI, uh, we see a lot of potential for AI to, uh, one, uh, try to generate the synthetic, what we call synthetic data sets that can be used to, that are similar uh, to what was collected earlier and later, uh, meaning that you're able to fill out the missing values uh, as well as also creating what we call new data sets. Uh, like if you have historical information and that works uh, potentially in climate when you have historical information, then you're able to forecast how the future will look like. And, and AI models are coming in in a big way to uh, bridge that up. And we see that as a, as a huge potential for us as, as government and also for the private sector uh, to work together to try and leverage on these potential and, and opportunities that uh, these new technologies are presenting. Thank you, Charles. And that's, that's a good point around um, the gaps that AI can fill in. So as a government, um, understanding there needs to be a part partnership, sort of partnership with private sector. We've heard from IBM speak around the intent to partner with government and, and development partners. Um, do you have an example of how uh, the, the um, as a government agency, you've been able to partner with the private sector, and what more needs to be done to really strengthen that partnership? Because we've seen them be the ones who are driving innovation and bringing some of these um, data sets that are not as open to government and development partners. We've done those conversations, and, and I just want to give a few examples of what you're doing at the agency. Uh, I'll tell you one of the earlier engagements we had uh, was introducing a research grant uh, that was in the financial year 20. 21, 2022, uh, where we gave a grant to uh, the universities to develop the research grant on small scale crop uh, uh, applications using machine learning and AI. And the reason why we were doing that was to one, uh, tap into the capabilities that you have within the universities to try and uh, help us come up with a solution. Uh, one of the other engagements that we are having is with um, NASA Harvest. Uh, it's a program uh, by NASA that is uh, run from the University of Maryland in the U.S. And they, they're working on using um, AI uh, again for crop mapping and crop yield, um, crop condition monitoring and uh, crop yield estimation. And we are working on, a, on, a, on a, laying the foundation of pilot, few pilot uh, projects where we will try to uh, test run the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the algorithm that we develop and see how effective they are uh, to provide solution within our ecosystem. Uh, then the other conversation we're having is with a local AI company. Uh, uh, it's called Adenian Labs, uh, essentially supporting quite a, a bit of startups in the AI. And the conversation is revolving into how can we uh, maximize on the uh, tech capacity that we have in within the ecosystem and direct that uh, what we sometimes call in in other language or in space uh, language to allow spin in of AI technology into the EO sector uh, as well as climate change. Uh, so that now we try and see uh, what we can leverage on because again private sector has has huge potential and they have the capability and uh, the time and the resources sometimes to delve deep in, in research and we, we hope as, 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 as government then we can tap into this because we also have a need in terms of the, the decisions. Um, so we want to tap into those linkages and we see the private sector as well as the academia coming in and playing an important role in, in helping us develop solutions that can help us bridge the, the gaps that you mentioned. Yeah, great. I think you've added a, in the, the pre previous panelists mentioned uh, domain scientists, um, private sector, farmers themselves. So I think you mentioned an interesting stakeholder, which is um, academia and, and also helping bridge some of these data gaps in that collaboration. The next question for you, Charles, is around the theme and cuts across the theme of today's discussion that is responsible data use. So as a Kenya Space Agency, we know your role is really at the country level um, to create standards and to think through uh, the use of, of, of earth observation data and, and ethical data use really plays a part in terms of earth observation 
uh, AI and all the other innovations that have been discussed today. Um, at the country level in Kenya and as um, Kenya Space Agency, what are some of the recommendations for um, ethical data use for some of this, uh, ethical data and digital use for some of these inno innovations that we have? It's, it's something that we're grappling with. We haven't figured out um, a way around it and, and part of the conversation we're having uh, with the stakeholders to uh, better understand what, what the challenges or the needs of the sector are. But I give the example of our observation. Currently, you have um, the potential, of, um, given the, the evolution of uh, space technology, you can get uh, sub-meter, um, uh, high-resolution imagery uh, on a regular basis, on a near real time, meaning that someone can easily monitor what you're doing at the back end. And, and I'll give the example um, uh, that has uh, the, the, the conflict that has been happening across the world. The particular private sector uh, uh, satellite image, uh, imaging firms or companies that have been providing insights in terms of uh, how how heavy machineries are moving, how aircraft are moving, so we're able to monitor how countries are mobilizing uh, if there is there is a war, which again begs the question in terms of uh, who should have access to that information uh, because essentially the same information if it falls on the wrong hands it can be used for the uh, for the wrong reasons and then the question is how how do you put in measures to to forestall that and one of the challenges that we face within government uh, and that is why we need to work very closely with the private sector is that the private sector is usually very much ahead of uh, the government in terms of uh, developing new solutions and testing uh, innovative solutions. And, and again, we have to en en um, uh, emphasize on the need for them to, to ensure that the technologies that they're developing are for the general good of the country. Uh, and again, also as government, part of the reasons uh, why we established, like, like the Kenya Agency has uh, a regulatory mandate, is to put in measures that also tries to forestall that uh, so that now we also don't have a technology that affects the, the, kind, uh, the, the use of technology that affects uh, the population. Uh, we are in the early stages. Uh, in fact, right now we're in the process of developing uh, what you're calling the, the National Space Pol Policy for Kenya, that will lay the foundation upon which then subsequent guidance and legislation, and even uh, uh, which is supposed to be followed by a space bill, uh, will be built upon. Uh, because what we're trying to understand is what ecosystem we're working on, because we also do not want to develop regulations that will impede the growth of a particular sector, whereas being cognizant of um, of the opportunities that those technologies would offer, but again also be cognizant that those technologies could be used in, in a negative way. So we're in that space where we are engaging on a regular basis with the stakeholders, and one of the things that we are hoping to do also as we go along is to set up what you're calling the community of practice, where different practitioners will be coming to share the insights and experiences and what they're doing. And then also as a sector, we would be able to then say what, what is the best way, even in terms of uh, the policies and even uh, the, ethical, uh, uh, the ethical question. So again, I think it's work in progress. There is need for more consultation uh, between, again, the private sector, the government, and academia, because, again, also um, the academia could also give us a few insights because they're able to do research um, uh, from using their students, and we hope to leverage in that. Thank you, Charles. I think you've highlighted an important point on the role of government in working private sector to really ensure the uptake of some of these innovations um, have citizens' uh, safety in mind, um, and it's an interesting perspective. I think uh, other, other stakeholders, such as Bobina, Christian, everyone mentioned the need for that collaboration and the roles of the different institutions in ensuring ethical details, and you, you really brought in that perspective of, of government. So uh, I'd, I'd like to wrap it up now, um, based on all that was discussed. So. We've covered quite a bit. We've discussed, we started off with access, um, thinking through users in mind as we, and, and design thinking as we uh, implement projects. We've thought about contextual data, so thinking about local partnerships and government partnerships that really push for the use of, 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 of data in the agricultural space. We've also looked at the standardizing approach 
from an agricultural perspective and the role of each stakeholders for that standardization approach. Um, we've also looked at, more specific to our theme, um, what are the existing gaps for ethical adoption of, of, of AI um, in agriculture? So think about national AI strategies, thinking about capacities in regulation for government or even research, do you even really know the state of ethical AI adoption in, in the African continent? And we also had Christian mention a lot about the role of private sector. So because, and, and this is something also Charles mentioned around pushing the frontier. We see private sector being in the forefront of these innovations, but what are their roles in, and, and how do they interface with government to ensure the ethical adoption of these innovations? And we've also seen from Charles how it addresses a number of gaps. So using the AI in terms of earth observation really comes in handy in filling key particular gaps, but there needs to be thinking through um, how to support um, the collaboration across all the stakeholders for ethical adoption. So I think it's just to say thank you to you all for joining the, the, the conversation.